Hello, um, I'm Florence Manuzzi from the Writers Guild of Great Britain Games Committee, and I'm chairing the session. Accessibility and inclusion are important ways of creating games that can reach and connect with more people. There are many ways to improve accessibility in games in all facets of game creation, and I would love for all teams to have holistic conversations about accessibility and inclusivity in the early stages of game development. However, today is about the practices that we as writers and narrative designers are best placed to affect. In a broad sense, I believe that game design involves making as many informed decisions as you can so that you can create a game experience that's as close as possible to what you want to make, rather than having decisions made for you because you didn't realize they were decisions at all. Accessibility is no exception to this, and I hope today's talks will give you writing and narrative design specific tools that you can use to make more informed decisions in your work moving forward. So we'll be hearing from two great speakers today. Harriet Freeling has worked in games accessibility and inclusion for five years, including creation of the games accessibility knowledge phase and working with many cats, studios, limit break and Bathia. Hannah Raymond Cox has worked in narrative for over eight years for games as well as other forms of media. This includes writing the narrative design of games that train people in what constitutes good mentorship, development management, and finding their own paths. As I mentioned before, there will be time for a joint Q&A later, so drop your questions in the chat and we'll get to them once both speakers are done. Um, and with that, Harriet is going to start. Hello, everybody. I've worked with lots of companies uh, for different reasons, consulting uh, and things like that. Uh, my passion definitely lies in disability inclusion across the board in all areas of the games industry. Um, but in particular, I'm very passionate about representation as a missing part of what I consider to be the full accessibility puzzle. Um, so first of all, uh, this is just a, a list of every single disability trope as listed on the TV Tropes website. Uh, so here are all of the ways in which people can get representing disabled people and, and the complexities involved uh, wrong. Um, it's not to say that using these things is a bad thing necessarily, but usually it is the only factor when considering how disabled uh, and neurodivergent characters are represented. Uh, and it's often in isolation as well, uh, meaning you may get a disabled character, cool, uh, but there are no other disabled people in, in the game world at all. There's no consideration for a world where disabled people would exist or be welcome. So with that in mind, uh, my first example of representation is the complicated representation. Uh, and with that, we'll look at the transhumanism of Deus Ex. Uh, it's great. You've got a main character who is dealing with the mental sort of management of what it's like to become disabled when previously you had no barriers in terms of life and then to suddenly be confronted with the, one of the iconic lines from human revolution is where adam says i never asked for this it's the only time in any of the games it said he's just one instant but that is something that every single person who is disabled can absolutely 100 percent identify with it's just so powerful as a, as a line um it does also have um, Yelena, uh, I can't remember her name. Uh, basically, she had uh, her narrative as an enemy. Um, her, she doesn't speak, she was traumatized as a child, and as a result, rarely speaks. And it's not the reason why she's a villain in the game. That's a whole other is, you know, thing. That's not the reason why she's the bad guy. Great stuff, we don't, we don't like that. Unfortunately, Hugh Darrow, one of the main antagonists of human revolution, is absolutely the whole this um, sort of cripple villain trope of he can't fix his problems, so now it's everyone else's problem. That's not, I mean, disabled people can be bad people, but we don't typically go around being, you know, making world changing global decisions based on the fact that we're disabled. More often than not, we can't actually access those kinds of resources. Um, and then obviously you get into the transhumanism thing, the idea that if you are disabled in any way, you are broken, that you must fix it with augments. So while there's the visual representation of seeing characters and a world that is set up to handle 
you know, augmentations or prosthetics, the overarching thing is like, if you have a barrier in some way and you do not fix it with augments, you are less, le less than anybody else. So it's complicated. It's good, but it's also, eh, could be better. Um, next, um, we've got um, Lester from uh, Grand Theft Auto V. Um, he's great. Not only is he an amazing representation of a physical disability that fluctuates, so he is both a wheelchair user and a cane user. So he's an ambulatory wheelchair user. Most representations of wheelchair users in games uh, typically literally model the wheelchair as part of the character to the point where they cannot be seen without it, as if it's somehow part of them. Unfortunately, he's the only disabled person represented in the game, like some sort of magic person where no other disabilities occur. So while the world is based in the real world, and so we'll have the relative disability accommodations made in, I think it's Los Angeles and so on, right? But there are no other representations of characters you in uh, Grand Theft Auto Online, you can't be a disabled character. So there's a sort of disconnect between the representation of a character versus the world that the character's in. Um, my most recent one, and this hurts me emotionally, Starfield is of the disabled people don't actually exist in the future a representation. Um, you could be a cyberneticist for who exactly? Because there's no one in the world that has a prosthesis or cybernetics. Who are you a cyberneticist for? It doesn't make any sense. Your ship is was basically constructed in the oops or ladders um, construction thing of, of starships. You just there's only ladders. So if you have any kind of you know barrier that means that you can't navigate a ladder, well, you're not being a pilot then, which doesn't make sense. You have you know other games where there are uh, helmsmen and pilots represented with mobility differences. So a game like this, that's literally, it has a poster in the game about cybernetics for veterans. You meet veterans in the game, but no cybernetics. There's nothing, even towns, you would think in the future that they would do town planning to think about how the world itself feels and is built to think, oh, Star Trek does representation really well for disabled people in the future and we've clearly got some inspiration from that but then just decided not to bother there's all these little elements so where are the disabled people uh clearly from you know my perspective as a disabled person the inference i get from that is eugenics happened they decided that the future would be better off if we weren't in it and so the whole world is designed for that um, and so I can't, it's really difficult for me to connect with the game as soon as I, I tried so hard, but as someone with a physical disability, I can't connect with it anymore. I don't believe in anything in that game because I'm not in the future. There is no one like me. Um, we get into that. I can't even use human words to quantify how terrible The Quiet Man as a game was in terms of disability representation and what that means for characters. Um, it uses deafness as a it does a simulation thing like you need to empathize and understand implying that in order to empathize with another person at all you need to experience exactly what they have rather than imagine it um you can't the whole game is is played as if you're deaf and you can only get sound afterwards it is so badly rated as a game it is universally panned both mechanic wise but in terms of like the representation the narrative as it, as it relates to disability so bad i don't know anyone that was like do you know what as a deaf person like, i'm hard of hearing myself as someone who was hard of hearing at no point did i go into the ground do you know what it's so great to see someone like oh wait no this isn't this is they didn't even talk to people with any kind of hearing impairment at all they just thought wouldn't it be great if we could just simulate that for other people and so it, it didn't work um and then just as a sort of content warning because this is this could be yeah uh for those who have disabilities and things like that this character is called professor von cripplespack now there's a lot to unpack with that it is basically two pejoratives for disability combined into one name and we are it's fantastic that as an industry and in terms of just creative media in general we've moved away from that for the most part 
Um, but there is stuff to sort of consider with that in that because of the legacy of games in the past that use these things, think about people who grew up playing this game, you know, and things like that, that becomes part of subconscious bias when it comes to how you perceive and think about disabled people. And then I have one other thing to talk about on this because this is, I tried to keep it short because there's a lot to unpack when it comes to representation. So I thought we'll just do some key ones. Um, disability coding. These are disability coding is characters that were not designed or written to be disabled. Their worlds were not written to accommodate disability necessarily. But people within certain like uh, groups will identify with those characters because they are coded in such a way that they identify with it in terms of disability or neurodiversity. Um, Big Boss and Solid Snake from Metal Gear Solid are coded autistic. Um, you've got the added thing of genetics in there. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, Solid Snake is a clone of Big Boss there. Um, Big Boss's coding for autistic is actually quite blatant for anyone who has any experience of being autistic or autistic people in their life. He's very clear on his, uh, he likes his routines. He's very big on special interests, special interests being uh, in-depth knowledge of weaponry. Um, he also experiences uh, multi-sensory experience, what the, the experimentation with multi-sensory, meaning he will, especially Big Boss, will literally eat anything he finds because he wonders what it tastes like. That's a big autism thing. <laughs> he doesn't like physical touch. He doesn't understand social cues. So, for example, in Metal Gear Solid 3, when Eva is trying to flirt with him, he hasn't got a clue. It's so blatant, but he's like... Um, he just ignores it and even in the, the narrative it's sort of she's kind of put off by that that's strange for her to have a man like him ignore any sort of like sexual interest or anything like that um you know he has that info he has a distant reliance on sameness the bandana the cardboard box the same weapons even genetically as like a family sort of aspect they have this strict thing of like we like the same things that's really common in autistic families as well like the structures and things echolalia it is a common thing with metal gear solid uh solid snake and big boss and all the main characters any metal gear solid uh game repeat back everything that they are told echolalia is a common part of many people with autism uh and a part of the diagnostic criteria echolalia you know Metal Gear, Metal Gear, for like three hours. He does it in SOCOM conversations. He will be on his own and repeat things he heard 10 minutes ago. Again, we do that. Um, you know, and overall the representation in Metal Gear Solid is, is again, like most representation, very complicated. So you have these, which is coded representation, but they do rely on that evil cripple trope, which is like Huey Emmerich, who is basically not a great man um but also disabled and the reason he's a bad man is because of his disability making him evil. oh he's so mad about it um and then you've also got like the visual representation side for venom snake in metal gear solid 5 where upon becoming disabled has a big red demon prosthetic and literal shrapnel resembling a demon horn the allegory is very obvious to disabled people whether or not it's obvious to anybody else we know what that means um an example of what i call successful disability coding is there was a fan theory for many years that symmetra from overwatch was autistic a lot of what she says a lot of how she is in cutscenes and, and things like that and was later confirmed um in passing uh, by one of the developers that yes she's she's on the spectrum somewhere um an example of when people are just they spot something that they can identify with and i would also say it's probably like a sort of quote unquote easy win um it can be sometimes difficult to get representation signed off sometimes but if you do it where it's just coded that way where you have these character traits you know get a consultant in who has those to sort of get it free representation you can confirm it at a later date once it's already been signed off you know it's one of those there's a lot of it in tv as well um to, yeah like for me games are how i as a disabled person learned things that I would never have the opportunity to learn is how I've managed to travel the world when 
previously my disability fluctuating as it was meant that I couldn't physically leave the house, never mind the country, to visit new places. Um, as an autistic person, it taught me social cues. It taught me how to have a complex social relationship with other people because games gave me that. But it also, games alienate me on a consistent basis. Like Starfield, what is the point of including? And I say this as an accessibility consultant. What is the point of making your game accessible if the people who will use those options to make the game accessible for them are not even represented in that world? What's the point of, of Starfield having large fonts if people like me aren't even in that? I can't even make a disabled character. I can't even make anybody that looks like me. There's not even autistic people in the game. They barely coded the adoring fan as autistic kind of thing. Like, it's just, it's it's so important to have that connection with the game. It just, it does move you away from that player to character connection if you are not even in that world. I can quite easily, you know, play a character that I am not. I can play, you know, and, and imagine what it would be like to be in that world. But I would surely see people like me in that world. I would be able to interact with other people like me, maybe simulate what it'd be like in a world where you're not judged for having a mobility aid. That would be cool. But games don't allow for that. And there's always these things of like, oh, we can't because of mechanics. And it's like, no, <laughs> it's, it is it is complicated. And I think a lot of it is partially due to fear. But there aren't a lot of what I would consider good character representation in games for disability, neurodiversity or anything like that. There are the most good you can get is it's complicated because it's very it gives with one hand and takes with the other. Um but the more we get more disabled people talking and open and having these kinds of things and these kind of discussions, the more we can build up that representation so that people can feel included and feel part of the game, you know, games at all, really. And that's generally my thing. I, I deliberately kept it as short as I could, basically because I will talk about this for hours because I'm so... It's that balance between passion and anger and not really being able to tell the difference. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. Um, if I if I hand over to, to Hannah to talk about um, her side of things and then I can answer plenty of questions later about things instead and do it that way. <laughs> Thanks, Harriet. Thank you so much. So I just want to echo Harriet is 100 percent right <laughs> to be saying that representation is a massive part of what we as game writers and narrative designers can do. Um, I'm just going to share a few short slides. Um, all right. So, um, firstly, I'm Hannah Raymond Cox. I've been working in interactive and immersive uh, narrative and writing for eight years. Um, and accessibility is a sort of, it's a way of working that once you try and integrate it with your habitual writing practices or design practices, it becomes easier and easier and more and more rewarding the more you do it. I'm not going to assume because this is, I know there's a broad spectrum of people who might be attending this. I'm not going to assume that everybody knows what games writing or narrative design is. So let's start there. So most writers, when you close your eyes and think of a writer for TV or film, uh, you write dialogues, you write people who talk to each other. In games, there are branching narratives and dialogues. So the choice you make may uh, lead to consequences in the conversation with how you talk to people. That's usually branching narrative. There's linear narrative, that's in things like cutscenes. Um, barks, that's the repeated or bank of short uh, lines. So for example, if you're in I don't know, Skyrim, and you're walking past someone on the street, they'll say something relatively innocuous that tells you a little bit about the world and how it perceives you, the player character, or what that character is thinking. There are cutscenes, which we briefly discussed, which are non-interactive ways of communicating story, plot. Uh, there's, yeah, cutscenes are great. Little, little movies or little film scenes. There's tool tips and other UI or UX supporting text. So anything that's not diegetic or in-world, you are responsible for writing that as well. 
there's item descriptions, there's trailer voiceovers, there's character descriptions, there's world building texts like in-game advertisement, the history books, poetry, riddles, lyrics. And then there's all the internal communications that you have to do as a game writer as well. So there's a lot of scope here to be thinking about accessibility and making sure that you're approaching it from a holistic kind of uh, vibe, I suppose. And depending on your audience, you may want to adjust your writing style. Now, competing accessibility needs are real. So it is really worth knowing who you are writing for. Um, and that target audience wants and needs will be different. So the first thing I would suggest, and I, I'm multiply disabled, but I'm not out as disabled at work. Um, and I am lucky that I can quote unquote pass for uh, non-disabled because we do experience discrimination. I'm also saying ask for help because even if you have lived experience of disability or neurodivergence, experts like Harriet can provide really useful feedback my disabilities and my neurodivergencies are very specific. So if I want to, for example, have a deaf character in my game, I'm not deaf. I can't, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on that. And um, I want to touch on this expert advice thing in a sec. The other thing as writers that we can do is clarity. Um, the BBC has a GEL um, uh, page which discusses uh, the importance of clear text and clear uh, writing approaches, which I highly recommend checking out. It's free. They've got tons and tons of resources. Are they perfect? No. But are they a good step in the right direction? Yes. Um, but if I were to give you one takeaway is end text with clear actions for players to respond to write with the so what in mind. This is one of the reasons why we talk about echolalia as something that happens in games all the time, because players will forget <laughs> non-neurodivergent players and neurodiverse players alike will forget what they are supposed to do. That clarity of action and how and, and choice in response that games is so interested in prompting you for is a massive part of a good piece of game writing. And the other thing I would say, especially if you are a narrative designer as well as a game writer, is offer flexibility to your players. So when I was working in, um, I made a massive space opera, interactive immersive game, live game, and there were puzzles for players to solve. I tried to make sure that there were multiple ways for them to solve that puzzle, to receive that same information that accounted for different learning styles, different heights, different uh, approaches to problem solving. Because what you want, ideally, is for your audience to walk away feeling what you, feeling the aims and the experience that you are designing for them. So let's talk about the business side of things. Games writing is usually a shoestring budget, last minute thing. Frequently, as writers, we are brought on once the mechanics have been established, once the world has been established. It's lovely when you get to start from scratch early on in the project, but it is not realistic. However, you can still center accessibility when starting a writing project. And this is... Uh, the thing I put a pin in, I'm going to unpin it, budget. So my the company I currently work for uh, was very hesitant to employ accessibility consultants, even when we were creating training uh, around looking after neurodiverse people in the workplace and how to communicate with neurodiverse people in the workplace. Um, and there is the information that I received was invaluable and it wasn't, it didn't break the bank. Um, it was very easy for me to advocate 
for the consultants I needed to write respectfully and responsibly by saying, let me have an interview for an hour and a half with the consultant and then have them come in again midway through the project to sense check my work for around the same length of time. That is three hours of time. And I was able to use that time wisely um, as best as I could to ensure that I wasn't going to go in with any uh, terrible representation or uh, repeating any horrible stereotypes because I made time and we paid the people who know more to do that. The other place to look into accessibility is your focus test feedback. Be ready to iterate. There is no shame in getting it wrong and then working to get it right. Like genuinely, I don't know any writer who walks away with their first draft in the final project. Think of this as another opportunity for that quality assurance check because people will notice when you put the effort in. The other thing we can do as writers is think about complexity, especially if you've got a heavily branching narrative. The more complex your writing and design, the more challenging it'll be to adapt and change when it comes to that feedback you get um, from your players and from the accessibility consultants. It's perfectly fine to have really flowery language and really uh, and and sarcasm and things that may be challenging for uh, people with competing uh, access needs. But think about who you are aiming for as your target audience and write for them. Don't write for the generic person and their generic needs because that person doesn't exist. Now, speaking of your target audience and your game or narrative director, whoever's basically your boss or paying for the game, <laughs> should be able to tell you more. But if you get pushback, two in five people in the United Kingdom experience some form of disability. One in three are... Uh, one in three of that two and five, so I'm not doing maths because that's not one of my skills, but within that group, they will experience neurodivergence rather than physical or um, mental disability, which is slightly different from neurodivergence. Um, so you, by not catering to the, by not like framing your writing with them in mind, your game will lose money. <laughs> because people won't want to play or buy your game. As writers, there is only so much we can do. However, can I write with accessibility in mind if it's not a priority for their company? I mean, as Harriet said, there are ways to backdoor accessible characters in. There are also things that feel like common sense that you can also if you've got a, mm, we don't really care, you can, especially at smaller studios, you can just go, I've got this research that I've done and I'm going to make sure that I'm writing for that target audience and do it yourself. Here are some tips. Um, I'm going to stop sharing some, my screen and just run through some generic writing tips. Um, so. Let's start with a really easy one. If you're asking a question, end the sentence with that question and let the player answer immediately. This is just good practice for the player's ability to remember what you said. It's a so what like uh, option and it allows you to maintain um, ease of documentation so when you're writing for games you're typically you are typically writing branching narratives and players will want to respond to the last thing they've seen so this is a really powerful way to hey do i have two questions next to each other 
uh, does that add unnecessary complexity? Does that mean that I, as the writer, now need to play test a lot more? So that's one really easy tip. Um, so let me give you an example. Who do you want to play with, Andy or Justin? It's like, okay, well, maybe I don't want to play with anybody at all. Um, you could start it with Andy and Justin are here. Who do you want to play with? And that locks down your player to the binary options that you're presenting to them frequently. In game writing, you are managing uh, what we call choice creep, which is combinatorial explosion. So if all of your, if you have a game that's, I would say, three minutes long, you're probably writing 15 unique options for that uh, amount of time. Um, don't ask rhetorical questions because that's a really quick way to alienate people who uh, may have some form of autism. I don't like, I am not autistic. I cannot speak for autistic people. But when I was talking with my autis autism consultant, that was one of the things that they said was really powerful. Um, offer distinctive sounding choices. So, this is something that, uh, as writers, is useful for audio, visual, and uh, action-based choice that we can offer the player. So, for example, I am in a stealth action game, and I need to get from one side of the room to the other. And I come up with two prompts for my player to do in a quick time action event. And if I write wait or walk, when that is read aloud, uh, those things sound too similar in most uh, English accents. Um, when I read them, say I have dyslexia, those are also similar in visual design, like the, the letters, there's a lot of crossover. Um, and then it doesn't, it doesn't actually give an immediate uh memory for the player so you could say instead hide or walk and those things look and sound different enough from each other and they inform more about who that player is being in that game so feel i really really recommend everybody get very comfortable with a synonym <laughs> dictionary um because the choice of words that you use is a really powerful tool to ensure that players feel connection with their character and a sense of agency in the world. Um, and they, yeah, the friction is removed. I have one last piece of advice. Um, when offering a choice, again, this is more of a narrative design thing. Um, a lot of research has shown for learning of all kinds and gaming of all kinds that three choices is the right amount for players to understand the differences um if you've ever played a game with a sort of morality wheel or a like you've specced into these specific skills that can get very complex very quickly um and frequently, the description of why the player is being offered that choice is not super clear. So because the UI of that text that they're given is so short. Um, and so if you're giving three choices, hi, Kara. Um, if you're given three choices, then whatever you choose as the player should be distinct enough from each other that it feels meaningful and you're not left with a nasty surprise um especially when it comes to if you have more than three tone becomes a really really big bit of it and even if you are neurotypical non-disabled players get really annoyed if they click on an option that feels like they know where this is going and can't tell so if you want there is also the option to put 
brackets or uh, tone indicators. So say, if your character is going to say something sarcastic, say sarcastic before they start talking. Um, and that is also a part of the writer's job. A lot of people leave that to voice actors, voice directors, but in games specifically, you are not often directing the stuff that you are writing. So make sure that that is shared. Um, I have a bunch more uh, tips and tricks and uh, discussions of the realities of writing in accessible ways. Please don't hesitate to ask questions in the chat. Um, I'm also available on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand back to Florencia. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, those, those were great, uh, really useful stuff. Um, I'm going to start with a question of my own, give people a little bit of time uh, for being a bit shy about the chat. Um, so it, it's come up um, that it's really useful to work with um, an accessibility consultant, um, to have someone with uh, the right experience to help you out. What kind of advice do you have to make those couple of hours that you can manage to get your studio to pay for to be the best they can be? What materials do you want in advance or give to them? What things do you want to make sure you bring up in discussion with them? I'm happy to talk about how I did it. Harriet is the accessibility expert. For me, I went in with a really clear, I'm going to be writing this kind of character this is and and have it be a real skeleton of a character like the character needs to serve this function in the narrative i'm going to have five or so conversations uh for the game i made for a uh, national mental health cognitive behavioral therapy in, in association with the national mental health cognitive behavioral therapy group um i knew that i needed to use their framework um but if I were to start from scratch, I'd go, okay, when am I seeing this character? What function do they serve in my story? What do I want the player to walk away feeling at the end? What, and and forgive me, but this was the, I only had the hour and a half. What are some horrible things that you've been told or that people have said to you that you never, ever, ever want to hear? What are, what are some interactions that I should just avoid or ways that I can flip that on its head so that the player character, the avatar um, that the player character is speaking to has a sense of personality and agency. I also wanted to make sure that I wasn't getting that one consultant to speak for every person with ADHD, for example. And so I'd say, is it all right if I preface at the beginning of the game that I'm I'm modeling this on one person's lived experience with ADHD and this is and have that character also say like, well, I like being called autistic, but Jeff down the road prefers to be called I'm a person with autism. And like that's his that's his deal. So I I tried to make sure that when I went in, I had really qu clear questions that I sent in advance. Um, and I budgeted around an hour for the questions to be asked. And then the extra half hour is whatever the accessibility consultant felt was important to share. Because I don't know what I don't know. So <laughs> that's how I approached it. Um, and as much as you can send over in advance through the like what what your game's about, what the mechanics are, all the rest, you may need to get legal to help them sign some NDAs, but it's worth it. From my perspective, as a consultant, the the main question I normally ask, and it's a question you need to be prepared to answer the actual reality of this, like the truth, why? Like, why are you including disabled characters? Is it because you want accurate representation or is it because you know that it's good marketing? Because that inf that changes how I as a consultant approach the advice I give you. If you're doing it because you see it as like a moral imperative to make sure that we live in an inclusive, inclusive environment where everyone's represented, I will go ham. I will give you as much as I possibly can to help you make the best representations I'm capable of doing, you know, but if it's a, well, it's a business decision, then you will get business decision related, you know, advice and things like that. Um, there's no point of me coming uh, 
and me asking why uh well we don't know we know we're supposed to okay but is this a business decision it's like well we, maybe it's like like hannah said before like the research that you do regardless of whether your company you know your, the way you work wants it or not if you've got that research that also helps when it comes to to getting a consultant because we know then where you're coming from where the company's coming from and can make better it basically stops everybody's time getting wasted with it because yeah can, um and yeah it's probably the hardest thing actually is like actually just sitting with like why you want inclusive you know like representation in diverse characters like why do you want it to do you want is it because you want that 290 billion purple pounds from the disabled economy that gets missed out on tell me i can help you with that i have all my own research that i can help you with the narrative side to help your company make money just knowing that it makes it so much easier to do my job basically have you had a great experience where things just kind of really went right that we could use to kind of learn from I do have one experience where I'll consider that I need to word it very carefully because I am still under NDA for the job that it was, but basically a situation where I was there for general accessibility consulting and representing came up as part of that conversation. It was seen as part of that whole conversation. You know, there were people from all disciplines involved with that consultation so that when it came to uh, giving advice on that, we were you know the consultants that were there we were able to point out like this would be a great point for you to do representation here like you have this opportunity this is laid out and we're able to give that advice so that eventually when if this project comes out that representation will be there and will have been a thought from earlier on in the development of the project meaning that it's more substantial it's been thought of more in depth um I think it was a Marvel game. I didn't play it, but they did a really great job of at least having it was based on um a Darren Thompson, I think, who works at Ubisoft um and is a wheelchair user there. And they made a character based on their themselves. It was literally, you know, so using real people to sort of get that representation. And I mean, sure, it wasn't like I say, representation's complicated for the most part, but it's just that seeing the opportunities being able to see those opportunities and help get that representation in that's usually like the best time there's not and it's also okay if it's complicated as well <laughs> like we are disabled people are complicated um we can be uh angels villains everything in between just like everybody else uh, i have a question for hannah now um so you mentioned that you know building up these different ways of writing with accessibility in mind and you gave a lot of tips that were honestly just good narrative design um things to include that are very useful do you do you have any more tips or do you have any way where you feel like these made the biggest difference i wish everyone could implement them just to make their yeah. games better so i think it depends on the kind of game you're making right i want to preface before i go in and give like all of the things i've learned um, I've made a lot of different kinds of games over the years. I am currently making gamified training, which is scored. So players either fail, partially succeed, or succeed. And and I think failure is kind of what makes a game, this is controversial, but what makes a game a game, right? The interactivity and the idea that your choices matter. Um, there are some fantastic games that, are, that that don't conform to this, but let's let's take those, thank them, and put them to the side for now. If you're going to fail your character, uh, or if you're if you're going to test your player as a writer, it should be clear what you're testing them on. Otherwise, it's unfair. So the clarity of intent and design is massive you should be able to uh, boil your sentences down to very simple what actors call intentions like i want this um or i feel this and that ca and that should be clear to the player when they are making their decisions um, and there are ways of doing this. So, for example, using smaller, less 
uh, misinterpretable words. Um, I'm a history graduate and historical language informs a lot of my creative practice when I'm not making games for major coffee companies or whatever. Um, so my tendency to use really, really complex ideas and language is I, I acknowledge it and I respect it, but I've got to think who is my, who are my players? Like, am I making this for me or am I making this for them? Um, and frequently I don't need the word egregious because that word, while I love it, is one of those words that can be interpreted as very, very good or very, very bad. <laughs> That's literally what egregious is. And it's like acknowledging as writers, we have points of view and we have things we want to communicate and always coming back to what you've written in the shoes of your players. Um, so yeah, shorter words, uh, less confusion. Um, uh, I'm sorry, my brain's just gone completely blank. But yes, I have lots and lots. No, if you want more, hit me up. Um, we have one question earlier uh, from someone in the chat uh, who's a narrative design professor and wants to introduce students uh, to this topic so that when they finally join the industry, they'll be aware that representation is needed and approach the right way. So in your opinion, what is a good way to spark their interest in this or what are some writing exercises they can experiment with? I do push a lot of like, I like to talk to students and stuff about just general accessibility anyway, because I am a firm believer if you can get the future of the games industry thinking about it as part of their like thought process, um, it makes it better. Um, I generally teach folks about thinking of things through like lenses. So whatever you're doing within games, writing, narrative, what otherwise, thinking of how that will read or be perceived by somebody you know, let's say with disabilities and different barriers, you know, um, I operate like most people under the social model of disability, meaning it isn't the disability that makes you disabled, but the lack of access that creates a disability. When I'm in my element, I am not disabled at all. That's why I work from home. When I work in an office, I'm then disabled. So it's, it's a lot like that. So it's even like, for me, it's, it's things like, okay, so what would it feel like and given that empathy everybody has their own experiences as well of temporary disability which is also something i talk about if you have broken your leg you are in the same position as somebody that has a mobility barrier that involves the same leg you know or somebody who has a limb different you are in exactly the same access you know in representation of like that if you're writing a character with a limb difference that's also somebody who has you know a broken leg will still empathize with that character as well the same with like a world if it's not designed for people you know the broad array of people it just won't uh set in so i tend to i tend to approach people like their sort of poor primal natural selfishness of like yes but it will you know nobody likes to to hear it but we will all be disabled at some point it's just that somebody got sub some people get subscribed a lot earlier to the disability plan than other people but you will get your subscription to, right so with students especially it can be challenging because obviously depending on the age range they're invincible and there is nothing you can tell them otherwise but you can get them with the empathy of okay but what about you know family members and things like that that is also a way um and it can also help them make connections with their family to play video games and take it seriously as well as an aside i would say if you're looking for a writing exercise um, there are tons and tons out there, but one I would hugely recommend is uh, take a conversation that two people have on TV, just any soap conversation, and then write a scene where the characters don't move. Write another scene where the characters only communicate physically, they can't talk. Write another scene where those characters don't see. Write another scene where they can't smell. Write a scene where one character does not pick up on the unspoken social cues that character one is giving out. And that as a writing exercise um, is really great because it can 
not only stretch you as a writer and you will need to be able to turn on a dime in this industry to be able to to write well and efficiently because you know uh, your your manager may go oh it's great but actually can we have it completely different by noon um but it also by putting those constraints on players or on the writers it gives them insight into constraints that their players may be feeling um or different lenses of approaching the same situation so one character may want to leave the other character may want to stay how does it change when you apply these artificial constraints um, that would be like my go-to writing exercise for thinking about uh, accessibility and disability. Are there any special considerations for writing accessible tutorials? And similarly, how do you balance presenting information in multiple different modalities, contextual UI tool, text, text, et cetera, so the information is accessible in different ways without overloading the player and potentially muddying the lesson? I love this question. I love this question so much. Accessible tutorials. Remember when I said short words and uh, clear uh, instructions? As much as possible when writing a tutorial, match that with the action you want the player to take. Um, and this is something you will have to discuss with uh, the rest of your team. But uh, if you can, if you are the narrative designer and the game writer, as many of us are, that is a really powerful way to start. Uh, the other thing I'd like to suggest is spoon theory. So uh, it's it's a model for discussing fatigue um, around disability, but it can also be applied to good tutorials. So the idea is everybody has a drawer full of spoons. To take an action, you have to spend a spoon. Um, and uh, some people start their drawer with fewer spoons than others. And when writing to accessible tutorials, you have an infinite quantity of spoons, right? You have as many like units as you want to give the player. It is better to err uh, on the uh, safer side and over explain and allow players to skip through quickly than it is to just let them flounder, uh, founder, I think. Um, how do you balance presenting information in multiple modalities? When do you do text versus tooltips versus UI? Make sure the information is accessible. Ideally, you would be able to pause uh, the game at any time to make sure that players have a, a reference to what they're being asked to do at any point. So I, for example, I was playing God of War and different characters have different colors that are assigned to their names depending on whether they're nice to me or not. I had no idea because I came in halfway through. Um, so having a, hey, I can pause this game and check this color. What does this color mean? Um, was very, very helpful. Whatever you do, though, keep it consistent. So I do not want to see the siege weapon called a trebuchet at one point, and then it's called a siege weapon something else, or, or then it's called a, a bombard somewhere, unless they are different things and mechanically different, consistent naming is so helpful. That would be my, um, that would be about presenting information in multiple modalities. Yeah, to, to double down on the, the consistency as well, like consistency in communication is so important for especially like if you consider for example uh any player that's using text to speech in order to navigate any experience lack of consistency in the communication means that they will not be able to parse the differences because the text to speech is doing the work in terms of them comprehending what's on screen and if the if the the verbs are not the same they're not going to be able to to interact with the game at all and punctuation is so important Consistent use of punctuation is huge. Um, I get like I I'm a recovering poet, so I understand. I don't always I want to use an, a dash for everything, but it is not accessible and it is not helpful. When it comes to writing things like barks, do you have tips for making them different from each other but still easy to understand? Um yes, I do. Uh there are some fantastic resources out there for really good barks. I recommend um, 
Raymond, uh, and I'm going to butcher their last name, Vermeulen, um, has really great resources about narrative design and game writing in general. Um, again, the same thing as the wait or walk problem, try and make the barks uh, meaningfully distinct. Um, so they should communicate something about the character um, that is slightly different. But there's also kind of a connected question asking if there's good directory or resources for accessibility consultants. So um, if there's any kind of extra information you would like people to, to take with them. Um, I will post a link. So one of the places that I work currently is a project lead at ManyCats. Uh, ManyCats Studios, basically, we do a lot of work when it comes to representation of disabled and neurodivergent uh, people working in the games industry, because one of the... Uh, it used to be cited as like an easy way to do accessibility and inclusion is just like talk to a disabled person that already works and make them do two jobs instead of one but don't pay them more and um, so our, our whole thing is that we we try and push for that so we have an experts page so consultants whether that's specifically accessibility or sensitivity consultant the majority of our experts are people with lived experience uh, in different arenas with a lot of different um, expertise across different like game categories some even do tabletop as well um and we basically just check them as well to make sure you know and give them that platform because we i mean we did a talk this year at the games accessibility conference about consultants because we know that within accessibility and sensitivity it's really difficult to find any information there's a lot of like smoke and mirrors about how much they charge and what they should do do you so this may be a little a tricky question um if someone wants to bring up an issue with their team or management about the way a disabled character is portrayed do you have any recommendations again this is a hard question so go for the stick if not it depends on your uh if management have decided that they don't care that firstly that sucks secondly i've been in your shoes Thirdly, there is a lot you can do as on your own to try and mitigate that or complicate the narrative that's stereotypical and harmful. If you are writing that character, you have ultimate agency, even if that ends up coding it, right? Um, for example, a different intersection where we saw this happen before was for queer characters and not palatable not marketable for the longest time and the coding meant that they could and it's not ideal ideally we would have them be like out and and visible representation but there are things you can do um also talk to your union because that kind of thing is what the writers guild can help with um and talk to your fellow writers because hey if all of you agree that this is not great then you have collective bargaining power <laughs> um and yeah that that would be my advice but it sucks and <laughs> i've been there yeah my my advice is the same sort of thing uh there was an unfortunate element with uh it's a line i often have to tell I, do, uh, I try and help people confidence when they've got disability and working in games because it is quite a demoralising industry in particular uh, sometimes. Unfortunately, just because something is against the law will not stop people from breaking that law, particularly if they do not see a cost factor that would benefit them to even do it. Like, what's the point? If there's no, like, punitive action that could possibly happen, like, they'll get away with it. Most, com a lot of companies will. Um, for me, I I have a, as someone with disabilities, when I say, hey, you shouldn't do that, that that sucks. Here's a load of resources and links to the proof of all the money you're hemorrhaging as a result of doing this. Sometimes you cannot get them on the emotional side. And it's like, I've said my piece on the, this is, this is wrong. And I've also given you all my research on why this is going to lose you money um when it comes to the rep the, the being reprimanded for it and stuff like hannah said that's you know talk to union talk to your peers with that and and get that support on that level because obviously again it's illegal but it won't stop them unfortunately because companies like that they'll just keep doing it unfortunately and document it if 
people say it in recordings, if people say it uh, in front of other people, um, if they write it to you in a Slack message, document it because you may have. And again, lawsuits are a difficult and challenging thing to do, but if it's uh, so obvious that it's actively hurting the people around you and it will hurt you as a person proposing accessibility um, and you feel that you might be retaliated against in your career, documentation of when it happens, who said it, where, in what context they said it, all of that stuff. But again, that's what the Writers Guild may be able to advise you with.